Welcome to Hedge Fund Tips with Tom Hayes. I'm Tom Hayes, and believe it or not, this is our 100th episode of the video cast and 90th episode of the podcast. Uh, it's been a great, great journey, and we're going to keep it going. Uh, met a lot of great people. I've attracted a lot of incredible investment partners through this. Uh, so um, just uh, thank you for tuning in each week over the last, I guess, almost two years or so. And, uh, and let's get to it. So first, I want to cover some of the media. Uh, tomorrow is Friday. I will be on Fox Business, the claim and countdown, sometime uh, just after three on the floor show. So check in on that. Uh, also want to thank uh, Devik Jane and Amber Wark for including me in their article uh, uh, earlier this week. It was, let's see, there uh, on Monday, kind of what to look forward to in the week. I said there's some inflation numbers coming out this week and the market will be looking through uh, to next week's Fed meeting to get an indication of color with the jobs report. So, you know, obviously the jobs report was a huge miss by two thirds that gave them cover to push off the taper. If the inflation numbers had come in super hot, um, then, you know, it would have been a, a, a kind of a counterbalance. Maybe they could move earlier, but with the inflation numbers coming in a little bit softer, albeit their high numbers, uh, I think, you know, obviously September's off the table, maybe a November announcement, but we've kind of been of the stance for the last six months. It's going to be a early 2022 event. Uh, we'll, we'll see how that plays out. And uh, and I also said expectations are now that the September meeting will be inconsequential uh, in that they'll just punt to November on any concrete plans for taper. So that was that. Next was uh, want to thank Sriyashi Sanyal and Gertrude Chavez Dreyfus for having me in their article uh, the next day. And I said we didn't get a really high number on CPI. The fact that they came in just below expectations gives the Fed the chance to punt any taper implementation announcements from September to November. The inflation numbers confirmed the Fed can push push it off a little bit more because uh, there were worries inflation numbers came in really hot, then the Fed's hand might be forced to move sooner rather than later in spite of recent employment numbers being weak. So uh, that was that. Uh, the theme of this uh, uh, episode, uh, we're going to start with a Warren Buffett quote, look at market fluctuations as your friend rather than your enemy, profit from folly rather than participate in it. So we're going to cover a number of stocks because while the general indices are only off uh, maybe 2% off their highs, uh, al although um, it feels like a lot more because I think it was, uh, you know, 10 out of the last 13 days were negative for the Dow uh, and S&P. Um, and the general indices have held up, but underneath the surface, there's been a lot of opportunity created. And we're going to go through, I think, about 25, 30 stocks that we think are pretty cheap in this environment. Uh, and you can draw your own conclusions. Um, <laughs> I figured I would put out a quote from Jack Ma, uh, who started at Alibaba. The very important thing you should have is patience. Uh, and we're going to talk a little bit about Chinese stocks, you know, more headline bombs this week. That's the bad news. The good news is uh, these are all seem to be holding their uh, lows from last uh, three weeks ago when the bottom was put in. Uh, these stocks seem to be holding up so far. And that's a positive thing. Allianz was out. Uh, and, and that's what we've been talking about for the last number of weeks is, you know, you'll know the end is near when the news can't get any worse and the stocks stop going down. And that's kind of what we're seeing right now. They're holding those those lows and um, and the news couldn't be any worse. So that that's really what we want to see. The Chinese Communist uh, government has basically hit every industry. I don't even know how they have enough regulators to deal with all the mandates they've put out. It's like they can't uh, uh, hit enough industries and companies quicker. Uh, they, they probably got more regulators than business people by now just to keep track of all the thing crackdowns that they say they're going to be implementing. But uh, leaving that aside, Allianz was out saying uh, three reasons to, to buy Chinese stocks. Chinese equities have always exhibited higher volatility and outsized returns. Chinese stocks don't move in lockstep with other equity markets, so lower correlation. And foreign investors are still buying China equities despite recent turmoil. Uh, we agree with all three. Tiho Brocken, B-R-K-A-N-O-T-I-H-O-B-R-K-A-N on Twitter. 
put out this chart from uh, JP Morgan says the correction in Chinese stocks is business as usual. And we've covered that a lot. You know, every few years, uh, the Chinese government decides to crack down on one industry. It looks like it's the end of capitalism in China. And then sure enough, they go on to make new highs. So we had a monster uh, uh, crash during the great financial crisis, then a modest one in 2011, 39%. Uh, another one in 2015, about 40 percent, and another one in 2018, about 32 percent, and we're at 32 percent right now. So, um, so that's that. So you could get some more pain for the general index, index, but the companies we're looking at, you know, it, it seems like uh, it seems seems like the end is in sight. Um, Okay, so then the latest one to get hit, which caused a sell-off in China and spooked foreign investors again, were the casinos this week. I love this article by Lawrence Strauss today. Macau's review of casino operations sparks a sell-off and a buying opportunity. I couldn't agree more. I mean, this is this; these are fantastic opportunities, even if they move against you a little bit. You know, just we're you know we we want we want to be exposed to this. Uh, there's no question about it, and and buying on weakness for the long term. Um, these companies have invested far too much in China and in Macau. If they shut that off, they would literally, there would be not another penny of foreign investment in China ever again. Uh, no one would put money in moving forward. So I think this is just another instance of uh, what Tiho pointed out with the JP Morgan of all these regular corrections that happen basically, let's see, three years, uh, four years, three years, three years. So every three to four years, the communist government uh, decides to do a crackdown, crashes the market 30 to 40 percent, and then it's off to the races and off to brand new highs once again. So uh, that's where we are. Um, this is the uh, BABA analog we put out a few weeks ago. It's holding these levels still out on the skinny branches. I think it actually close, closed uh, close to flat today. Uh, it was down big on the Macau News this morning. Didn't take out the lows from three weeks ago and close close to positive. And the K-Web might have even closed positive, the ETF. So uh, that's good to see. Again, strength on bad news. China's economy recovery is looking gloomier. This is from the Wall Street Journal. We've talked about this. The Chinese government has really uh, uh, taken a grenade to their own economy with the, this posture, number one. Number two, the zero COVID policy. Uh, of shutting down regions on and off has, has uh, impaired consumer confidence. And number three, they tightened too quickly. Uh, in COVID, they started tightening policy uh, uh, just over six months ago. That's caught up with them. And, and now they're going to have to reverse it. And we, we will see in the article of the week that managers are expecting now uh, that China is going to have to reverse and, and put out some massive stimulus to uh, keep things going because remember they're, they've got like a hundred thousand jobs now lost uh, uh, or at stake in the uh, education sector that they crack down I'm sure some of these bigger tech companies are going to be laying people off uh, to deal with some some of these uh, the regulatory headwinds and uh, consumer confidence is low the shutdowns are low so uh, the, the, the bad news is it hurts bad businesses. The good news is the big businesses pick up share, as we saw in COVID in the U.S. as well. Uh, and uh, it will be no different in China. So expect more uh, stimulus. The other thing that's interesting now, it's starting to become an embarrassment for China. They're supposed to be the second largest economy in the world. And now there are no Chinese stocks left on the global top 10. They're the second largest economy and they don't even have one in the top 10. Uh, I think they're going to probably want to uh, to get back up into a global competitive position sooner rather than later. Uh, this is this has got to be somewhat embarrassing for their country and for their sense of nationalism because they were and are a major tech innovator and Alibaba's growth rate uh, in terms of AWS, etc., was faster than Amazon. Uh, they were growing in Southeast Asia, and that's continued. By the way, uh, it's just priced differently because of the regulatory risk. And as soon as the government lets go of the reins and takes their foot off the governor, uh, these things are going to be back on the top 10 list. But for right now, it's kind of embarrassing to be the second largest economy and not even have one of the top 10 companies in the world. Uh, and I'm sure they're feeling that. Moving forward, uh, this was an interesting article in the uh, in the Washington Post from uh, Scott Got Gottlieb, the FDA commissioner in the last administration. And 
he's kind of been a steady hand through all this. He does sit on the board of Pfizer. But the last question really stuck out to me in the interview. It said, um, what's giving you optimism as we move forward? Well, first of all, the pace of technology. I think we've had tremendous success being able to track this, target COVID, and develop vaccines against it. We're going to be able to develop drugs that can be taken as a pill and prevent progression of severe COVID or even prevent onset of infection in people who have been exposed to it. Much like we have Tamiflu for influenza, we're going to have a drug like that for the coronavirus. Uh, we're going to develop newer, better formulations of these vaccines that are not uh, that are going to have better characteristics in terms of storage requirements and are going to potentially confer even more durable immunity. Uh, are going to potentially allow us to vaccinate against a compilation of variants rather than just a single variant as new variants emerge. So, uh, you know, from the beginning, I've said the game changer would be obviously the vaccine, but we didn't expect them to happen so quickly, and they did, which was a, a godsend. But, but the game changer will be an antiviral of some sort where either if you get it, you can take a pill and it, you know, goes away in three days like a Z pack of, of sorts for, ta for, uh, for coronavirus or something along the lines of what Dr. Gottlieb's talking about here. You haven't heard much rhetoric along those lines. Uh, I know there's a hedge fund Ridgeback working with Merck that has one that was supposed to be out by the end of the year. That would change the game because then everyone could just go back to normal. They'd have their vaccinations. If they get get it, they take their Tamiflu, you know, Tamacovid, whatever they're going to call it, and uh, and and they they get on with their life. They're back in work in 24 or 48 hours. So uh, it's coming to a theater near you. Uh, uh, this is interesting. Southeast Asia has added 70 million online shoppers since the beginning of the pandemic. Report finds, which is really helpful to companies like Alibaba, which has a tremendous international business uh, in Southeast Asia. They're not just China. Uh, I think. Some, something in the neighborhood of 20, 29% of their business, I think, is outside of China. So this was nice to see. I don't see this uh, uh, contracting habits have changed and they're going to be the beneficiary once they're able to participate freely. Uh, this was a, a, an interesting article. CapEx booms as companies prepare for a post-pandemic world. If you read my article this morning, which we're going to go through now, that was one of the key tenants in, in why I continue to have a sanguine outlook moving forward. Uh, and uh, you can see here, after you go from a steep contraction in investment in equipment, structures, and software, uh, you often don't get, ye you know, uh, months, you get years of the CapEx contraction, uh, CapEx expansion. And, uh, you know, if you look after the 1990 recession, you got CapEx expansion for nine, nine years, basically. After the 2000 recession, you got CapEx expansion for about five or six years. After the great financial crisis, you got CapEx expansion for about 10 years. And here we are only just about a year, year and a half into CapEx expansion, and that's bullish. So, uh, so that was a helpful table from Bloomberg. Uh, the other thing, you know, a lot of stuff's going on with the tax uh policy and the infrastructure package the good news on the tax policy is it's going to be a lot better or uh, depending how you look at it it's going to be a lot better for the markets than people uh, anticipated the corporate taxes will be lower than the worst case scenario the capital gains taxes will be wor lower than the worst case scenario uh, a lot of crazy proposed taxes are not get, not going to be on the table so uh, all that's pointing in the right direction obviously mansion had a, a big role in taking the size of the package down from you know 3.5 trillion, which would have amounted to about 5 trillion when you add in the real infrastructure, uh, to now uh, managers expect about 1.9 trillion when all is said and done. We'll see how it shakes out. Uh, another interesting thing, you know, as we get into the reopening stocks, Uber I thought was very interesting. Believe it or not, um, Uber got upgraded this week by Goldman Sachs. It's trading like death, and I think this is a, a great reopening play. Even though the valuation is a little rich for my general liking, I do think it has a moat, obviously a duopoly with Lyft. But, you know, Lyft's not, like, I don't know. I, I don't know anyone who really goes to Lyft first when they need a ride. Like, may, maybe they will, if, depending on the area. But most people go to Uber first. And um, I think that at these levels, it's interesting. Uh, Goldman sees 60% upside. Uh, so I thought that was kind of a nice combination of a reopening trade that uh, has a relatively high valuation, but, you know, 
relative to kind of their control over that market internationally and their current valuation and the outlook moving forward as travel comes back, it, it starts to look, look interesting. Uh, Boeing lifts their long-term demand forecast amid signs of industry recovery. This came out two days ago. Uh, quote, as our industry recovers and continue to adapt to meet new global needs, we remain confident in our long-term growth for aerospace, uh, said uh, CE, uh, Chief Strategy Officer Mark Allen. We are encouraged by the fact that scientists have delivered vaccines more rapidly than imaginable and that passengers are demonstrating strong confidence in airplane travel. Uh, 10-year outlook, Boeing's projecting 19,333 deliveries, higher than last year's forecast of 18,000 uh 18,350 that's a huge uh upgrade and, and although right now overall the updated 10 year pro uh project is still 6% lower compared to the one from 2019 uh and they feel that domestic market should recover to pre crisis levels in 2022 that is amazing if the domestic market returns to pre crisis levels by 2022 that is some snapback uh, in, in travel, and that would absolutely be phenomenal. And these numbers will go back up. I mean, the fact that they're this close to where they were pre-pandemic already, uh, and there's no international travel is staggering. Wait till international opens up and everything, you know, you get one of these pills at the end of the year and it changes the game. So we continue to love Boeing here and, um, and our adders on weakness. Uh, okay, the st stock market's undergoing a slow motion de uh, deterioration with pockets of shares down 20% or more. So this is by Bob, Bob Pisani. I, I think this there's another way to look at this, and, and that is uh, the opportunities under the surface. I mean, um, you know, what he's basically saying is uh, he points out that the percentage of stocks that are 20% or more below their 52 weeks highs in the S&P 500, you have 15% of the S&P 500 that have corrected 20% off of their 52-week highs. And this is what I've been talking about the last few weeks. There's so much opportunity under the surface of high-quality companies. Now, do I want to be chasing small caps that are down, you know, 40, 50%? I mean, maybe. that That's more, more speculative. But if I can get high-quality companies that are down 20, 25, 30% in the last couple of months... Uh, and their earnings outlook looks reasonable and their multiple is reasonable. I want to get exposure regardless. You can debate all day. Are we going to get a September swoon? Are we not going to get a September swoon? I just want to buy the things that have had the summer swoon that are high quality, reasonable multiples, look out 12 to 18 months and enjoy the ride. So we're going to go over a bunch of those. Um, so he, he points out a number of them. American Airlines down 26% off its highs. FedEx down 20%. DuPont down 20%. PPG down 18%, Caterpillar 17%, Lockheed Martin down 14%. We love Lockheed Martin. 3M down 12%. Uh, Nordstrom down 41%. That's a high quality retailer. Um, uh, and he just goes through the different sectors, retailers, luxury retailers, home builders. Uh, you know, we got a 5 million home shortage. So, uh, you know, as the supply bottlenecks uh, work themselves out, the demand for housing is still going to be there with the boomers. Buy on weakness, Pulte's down 26% off of its 52-week uh, highs, KB Home down 20%, DR Horton down 17%. So, you know, for everyone saying like, oh, we got a crash, uh, when you look underneath the hood, there, there's, there's a lot of stuff to do. Uh, and one of the groups that we covered, talked about last week was transport. So I went over the weekend and I did the uh, top 30 weights earnings estimates. And what we found in the last 60 days is that uh, the earnings power of these top 30 weights in the transports ETF uh, sector ETF, uh, the estimates were revised upward by 21.86%. So while their stock prices were crashing, transports got hit hard over the summer because the reopening trade got hit hard due to Delta. There are a lot of airlines in here, a lot of freight, a lot of uh, cruise, uh, cruises in here. Um, you know, Uber's in here, airlines are in here, trains are in here, shippers are in here, um, but a lot of airlines. And while their stocks were getting hit like crazy, their earnings estimates were revised up 21.8%, and 2022 estimates were also revised up 5% over the last 60 days. So we like that. Estimates revised up, 
price goes down, high quality, we get involved. That's, you know, it's a simple formula. It's not rocket science. The question is, can you deal with this? Look at market fluctuations as your friend rather than your enemy. Profit from folly rather than participate in it. And sometimes, you know, especially during the summer, it can be just like, it feels like, ah, oh, when is this going to end? And, and when are these going to get bid? And then they do. Jack Ma put it right. The very important thing you should have is patience. If you know you're in great companies and you bought them at the right price, you just hang tight. And because when they turn, you know, here was the last time, November of last year, you know, Uber basically doubled in, um, you know, three months was basically the, uh, yeah, almost doubled in about three, four months. You know, uh, so these are some of the stocks that we're looking at that are, uh, that have come down huge. And we'll see in the article how clear it is. And, and that's why I love doing these podcasts and articles because it really clarifies it for me and for my investors and my partners so we can take advantage of these things. Um, you know, seeing a lot of the visuals is, is very, very helpful when you're putting money to work. And um, I'm actually going to just scroll down really quickly because this chart really stuck out for me last night. I put this together. This is the ratio chart of the uh, S&P value index to the S&P growth index. And you can see, we were talking about it last year, you know, we were saying right before the election, value and reopening stocks were absolutely in the tank. And we were like pounding the hell out of oil, banks, financials, etc. Everything that no one wanted. And, you know, you got this huge inflection um, and over the next, from November to March, it was just like unbelievable things were happening. Uh, and that happened all the way through June. And then we started saying, okay, rates are going to compress here. We want to get some tech exposure. That's when we were putting out Splunk and some of the others. Um, so it's this ratio between value and growth has now gone to an even better opportunity than it was right before the election, meaning the ratio of value to growth has dropped lower than it was before the election, right before liftoff, when it just absolutely ripped the doors off. Uh, so, so we want to take advantage of that. And these are some of the stocks that will benefit as that happens. And we talked about some of the catalysts for that as it relates to um, the 10-year yield. And, and if you recall, over that period of time, one of the drivers of this huge move was 10-year yield spiked up. And I think we're going to see the exact same thing. We might have a couple fits and starts and fake out short term, but that 10-year yield is going to move towards 2%, whether it's 175 or 225 by Q1, uh, Q2 of next year. That creates a perfect environment for short duration earnings versus long duration earnings of tech. Uh, long dated earnings. Uh, when when rates go up, people want the cash cash flow now. When rates are low, people are willing to have the cash flow later. Uh, and uh, and I think we're moving back into a want the cash flow now very imminently. And that's how we want to be positioned. So we'll talk more about that in a second. Let's take a look at some of these stocks. So you know, Uber down a third in the last uh, you know handful of months due to Delta, due to the change in rates. Uh, same thing with United Airlines down 25% in two months, Southwest down 10%, uh, 25% in two months. Um, uh, here's Activision Blizzard. That's not really a reopening stock per se, but it, it's it's one that's you know gotten battered. It's down 20% in the last few months. Dollar Tree, uh, same store sh story, short term spike in shipping costs it impacts their margins in the short term. You got to look through that. Uh, the stock's down, you know, give or take 30% in the last uh, handful of months. Basically, since since this chart, because that's it's basically a value stock, since this chart turned from growth, uh, from value to growth, and value rolled over, these type of stocks got hit, and we're, our bet is that that's going to reverse before the end of the year, and these stocks are going to get bid. Uh, Kraft Heinz, same exact thing. Hormel, same thing. Uh, Fleet Core, you know, similar. They're in the transports. Mastercard, you know, mobility was down a little bit with De with Delta. That's going to change. We'll we'll look at the global COVID cases in the article. Uh, Fidelity National Information Services has gotten pounded. They're down 25, 26 percent in the last couple of months. So there's a lot to do, and these are not you know hundred million dollar companies that you're gambling on. These are huge companies that like if you get it wrong and it doesn't you know make new highs in four or five months 
it might take a year. So what? You know, it's not it's not the end of the world. Um, AT and T, same story. Now they're going to be a pure play on 5G and uh, eventually 6G. Um, General Mills, uh, the healthcare company Centene. It's the same basic similar story to Cigna. Um, Cigna was uh, down due to the medical care ratio spiking up in the short term due to COVID expense from the Delta wave. You got to look through that because their pharmacy business, Evernorth is up 13% year on year. Now people are going back to the doctors and getting scripts. So you want to get exposure to these high quality franchises. So Cigna's down uh, 30%, give or take. Uh, let's see, 20%. All right, 20-25% in the last since this changed, okay, from value to growth. Cigna is more of a value stock. You saw this in May, June. So, you know, it's like people are trying to figure out what happened to their business. Nothing happened to their business. It, it's what happened to rates. All you need to know is what happened to rates. Rates compressed, value went down. Rates start to go up in anticipation of taper, value is going to get bid, and there's going to be a lot of money to be made. So if you want tech exposure, you start to look at value tech, like Intel. Uh, here's Philips 66. If you want to get exposure to energy uh, in a way that hasn't, you know, run away, here's Suncor. You've got Verizon. Uh, I talked about the um, the drug pricing uh, thing getting shot down in the new plan. So that's going to help, you know, these drug stocks gotten hammered uh, uh, because they thought there was going to be a drug pricing uh, problem in the new bill. It seems like it's not happening now. Uh, so these these stocks, the Amgens, the Mercs of the world, even the J&Js will start to get bid. Um, VF Corp, that's down 25% uh, in the last couple of months. Again, since it shifted from value to growth, since rates compressed, and now they're going to expand once again. Um, so you got Philip 66, you got Cigna, you've got Intel. So there's just a tremendous amount of opportunity. Some of these drug companies like Vertex, uh, Alibaba, we still like. It's holding. Um, even these staples, Clorox and uh, Colgate Palmolive, etc. These are value stocks. They'll start to get bid. Um, uh, Citrix System, you've got um, Paul Singer in there with Elliott Management doing an activist campaign. This can work up to 140 plus. Uh, Campbell, again, we just, you know, and Lockheed Martin, which we love like we love Boeing. Again, this is just correlated to transports to airlines so as delta comes down and as rates go up these things are going to get bid and same thing with las vegas sands and win which we covered earlier uh we think this is a huge opportunity this week and today uh you know these are no-brainers so if you're right you're back up to 55 60 on las vegas sands in five to six months if you're wrong it takes 12 to 18 months but you know you're still going to dramatically outperform the s p same thing on win you know if you're right uh, it's up at 1.30 by February, March. If you're wrong, it's up at 1.30 by the end of next year, you know, 140, 160 by the end of next year. I think it's going to be sooner. When these things turn, and I was talking to one of my favorite investors uh, this week, and I said, you know, it, it's like Chinese water torture, but when these things turn, uh, they're not going to let anyone in. It's, it's, it's just going to be straight up. And then everyone's going to be waiting for the retest, which we just got, by the way, uh, and they're going to be looking for the, quote, real retest, which is never going to come, and they're going to be up 80%, and then you're going to see people on TV saying, uh, we like this now, it's great, you know, you know, buy it on a pullback, and it'll just keep pushing up without them while they wait for that pullback after it's up 80% and they missed it. So it's just, it's not a wrong thing, it's just it, when you've seen this so many times, uh, it's just a question of, how many scenes are in the movie, right? Like, you know, sometimes you think there are 50 scenes in the movie. It turns out there's 70 scenes in the movie, but the ending is still as anticipated. Uh, so we just have to see how many scenes are in the movie. My guess is we're getting close to the long end of uh, the spectrum and we're, we're at uh, scene 68, 69 out of 70, uh, even if we thought maybe there were 55 or 60, but we're, we're, we're now in, in the, you know, bottom of the eighth, top of the ninth, and, and we're, we're ready to inflect. Um, okay, so the article of the week is credit spreads in the stock market plus sentiment results. Uh, I thought this was useful. I did, I overlaid high yield credit spreads relative to the S&P 500. And the point that I was trying to get across is that, you know, people look at the S&P and they see, wow, look how much it's rallied off the lows. 
Uh, and that's, you know, that's fair. And especially you get a, all these people out there putting out um, uh, arithmetics charts, which makes it look parabolic versus logarithmic charts, which is on a percentage basis, which makes it look more normalized and people freak out. Uh, the point is it, it has had a big move off the bottom. But what you see is that when credit spreads contract off of hugely dislocative events like you saw in you know 2000 and then in the great financial crisis uh, 2008 and 2009 and then 2015 and 2016 with oil with the credit markets uh, uh, freezing up and then in the pandemic so you get these spike up where high yield spreads blow out uh, and then they come back down to normal and what most people think is oh my gosh you know, the credit markets couldn't get any better. But you could have said that in 2017, right after this spike in 2016. And the fact is, the market rallied for another year and a half before correcting. Same thing in 2011, you could have said, oh my gosh, credit spreads are as good as they've been in a long time. And then the market rallied again from 2012 to 2015. So for another three years before they spiked up again. Same thing here, they spiked up, they got down to these normalized levels. And then the market rallied for another three or four years and you just see it over and over and over so we're just at this beginning stage uh where uh credit has become easy normalized and usually you're going to get one to three years extra of these favorable environments which is usually constructive for equity markets as well and i think we're going to move into an environment because you know you can look at this s p chart and say trees don't go to the sky and you'd be right but I think you could find yourself in an environment where the general indices can be more subdued and start to consolidate, you know, sideways and may, may, may only be up, you know, I don't know, call it, you know, uh, by the way, um, I think it was something like, I think the equity markets were up. In, in, in the two taper years, 2013 and 14, I wrote it down for one of the shows I was on. I, I don't have it, but I think it was up like, so the, the the Fed had intimated that they wanted to start to taper in May, uh, May 1st of 2013. And they thought they wanted to do it in June. And they wound up punting to December. And um, the... 10-year yield went from like 162 to 292, and then it finally topped out at 3% 3, 3 uh, about 13 days after they tapered in December. But everyone's afraid of taper. The S&P 500 was up, I think, 30-something percent in 2013. And then after taper started in December 2013, 2014 was still a double-digit year for equities, a bit more bumpy, but I think it was up somewhere between 10 and 14%. Uh, you could just Google it, but but I was, I was surprised to see the continuation after the implementation. And, uh, and part of the reason for that is that the liquidity doesn't, doesn't stop when they start taper, and we're gonna go into that a little bit right now. But last week we said, while everyone debates whether we are going to have a September swoon or not, take a step back and look for uh, sectors and stocks that have already had a summer swoon and buy the quality stocks that are on sale. So we just went through, you know, call it two or three dozen of them uh, in that con. And by the way, this is not advice. This is opinion. I don't know what your situation is. Talk to your financial advisor, click terms on hedgefundtips.com. Uh, but these are the things that we're looking at. So uh, our sanguine view has not changed. Here's why. Number one, uh, high yield credit spread contraction is in early days. So um, again, this is the same story. We've shown I've shown, okay, I got to correct that. <laughs> uh, well, I've shown the top part of this chart many times as a way to debunk the idea that we're due for a 10 to 20% correction because of valuations, i.e. you don't get a bear market, i.e. a 20% correction without a recession, and you don't get a recession without a yield curve inversion uh, and a choke off of credit. So just to reiterate, this is when the 210 spread uh, goes below one, you have an inversion like we did in summer of 2019, about six months before the pandemic started. Uh, that was your tell. So 
you know, when you get an inversion, usually six to nine, 18 months out, you're going to get a recession. You're going to get your 20% plus correction. Same thing happened in summer of 2007. Same thing happened in uh, early 2000. So um, uh, we are at the opposite part of the spectrum. We're as steep as we've been in a dozen years uh, or, you know, a, a decade, give or take, uh, we're up at these levels and these levels can persist for a few years before they start to come down. And even in the period when the, the 210 spread starts to uh, converge, uh, the equity markets still like it because you got growth happening and good things happening. So, um, uh, and I tried to emphasize that again, this was a reiteration of this. It gives you a little better visual. We're just starting these favorable credit conditions. Um, you know, there were a number of notes out. Well, with credit conditions, this, this good, it can only get worse from here. No, it can stay here for a long time, like multiple years, like it does every cycle. So, uh, that's our base case. Uh, corporate buyback announcements were at 700 billion. Microsoft added another 60 billion. So, you know, call it 750 billion uh, here or there with low rates. That's going to continue. Third reason is unyielding liquidity. Assuming the Fed announced a 15 billion per month taper in November to commence in December, which I think it's going to be punted into uh, Q1 of 2022. Uh, it would still take until July of 2022 to unwind the whole program. And over that period, $450 billion of additional liquidity would be pumped into the system over and above the $4.2 trillion pumped in since the pandemic. So another 10% of liquidity. Uh, and that figure excludes the reinvestment of principal and interest. So that's another two to 300 billion. So now you're talking like 15% more liquidity on top of the 4.2 trillion. So it's like, go ahead, short, short the Fed. Good luck. Um, uh, okay, next reason, number four, 4.5 trillion in money market funds. Now this used to just be kind of like, wow, that's a lot of money. Well, compared to what? Well, compared to pre-pandemic, it was 3 trillion and there was low to no inflation. Now there's, you know, almost 5 trillion and you've got inflation ticking up. So this money is currently losing purchasing power on a daily basis due to inflation. So they're not being conservative. They're burning money by leaving it in money markets and they're losing purchasing power. So eventually that money is going to have to move into risk assets. And that's another, you know, call it uh, three to almost five. That's another trillion and a half to two trillion dollars uh, coming into equity markets that uh, to get back to uh pre-pandemic levels of um of money market funds so there you go uh fifth reason that i'm sanguine 2022 earnings estimates still too low just a handful of months ago in 2022 down here we uh, uh 2022 estimates were at 200 dollars a share for the s p 500 today they're near 220 considering we're in the capex cycle and where we are in the capex cycle and inventory restocking which we covered earlier. We're early days in this CapEx cycle. Take a look at this table here. Um, we think estimates can move up to $230 before year end. Yes, there'll be some Delta headwinds and yada yada from August and et cetera. But I think as we get closer and that uh, is rear view mirror stuff, uh, estimates are gonna go up. Uh, reason number six, uh, global Delta cases seem to be rolling over. This was from earlier than the week. Uh, Carl Quintanilla and Fundstrap posted it from JP Morgan uh, Chase. And this this is looking really good. <laughs> it looks like, a, for all the technicians out there, it looks like a head and shoulders top, which means it's going to plummet to a measured move of uh, 500,000. So it's going to go, we're going to go to negative 100,000 cases. So that, that'll be great uh, for all the technicians out there. All right. Um, Seven, travel holding up despite Delta, huge pent up demand. I mean, it was a little weaker this week. Um, you know, obviously it's more than double last year, but that doesn't say much. Uh, but it's still, if it was down, you know, 40, let's see, 30, 30, 35%, for, call it 35% from pre-pandemic levels for September 14th. But that's that's only recent in the last week. Like a week ago, we were you know 1.8 million uh, TSA pass through versus 2.4 pre-pandemic versus 700,000 last year. So we're gonna get there. And the minute this these 
these delta numbers come down materially in the U.S. This is going to pick, tick back up over 2 million like it was September 6th. was over 2 million relative to 2.2 million pre-pandemic. Um, so we're, we're there. It seems like we're kind of in that 70% neighborhood. And, and keep in mind, that's without business travel. So leisure is probably bigger than it was pre-pandemic, uh, even with Delta. And then, you know, business will come back. As the offices get filled, people start do, doing business trips and everything else. Um, eighth reason why I'm still saying when the rotation, if we follow the same pattern leading up to taper implementation as we did in 2013, the 10-year yield should approach 2% by Q1 of 2022, even if we have some short-term fits and starts. Here's the pattern from, this is when they uh intimated in may of 2013 so they had this move off the lows uh crisis lows like we had here off the crisis lows uh if you remember the european debt crisis uh fake out and then it started to move up once uh taper looked like it was happening it went from 161 bips to almost 300 by the summer and then by the taper it hit three percent uh and that was the peak for the cycle so it was sell the rumor of bonds yields went up and then when they actually implemented that was the peak in yields for another five years all the way until 2019 and i think we could see a similar situation maybe we get a peak who knows i mean 220 240 basis points i don't know 225 and maybe that's the peak for the next five years we'll see um this is supportive of those reopening sectors that have taken a breather since q2 Small caps, emerging markets, which of which 30, uh, China is 35%. Commo it was 40% before the recent correction. Uh, com waiting. Uh, commodities, value, and cyclicals. So here's small caps. This will be a beneficiary as rates start to tick up as it was uh, last year, you know, pre uh, when the value to growth ratio was this low. This, is, this chart right here is the most important chart of the next couple of months right here. When this starts to inflect, the game has changed. And if you have exposure to the type of stocks that I'm ta talking to you about, these two pages, you're going to make a ton of money, um, in my view. So, um, okay, we covered these two, but I wanted to reemphasize because it fits in with the theme. Uh, uh, valuation gauge, 20-year low favors small cap U.S. stocks. Luthold Group says they haven't been this... Uh, inexpensive relative to the S&P since uh, the beginning of the, since the last, since after the tech wreck. So in 2001, 2002, when small, small caps had one of their biggest runs from the early 2000s to 2006, 2007. Uh, and, uh, and I think we're, we're teeing up for a similar situation. Uh, emerging market stocks, same exact story, haven't been this low since after the tech wreck. I think we're, we're setting up for a similar story. Emerging markets also had one of their biggest runs from 2001, 2002 to 2007. I think we're going to have a similar situation. It bodes well for commodities. And I think this is going to reverse imminently uh, from value to growth as rates start to tick up after a couple head, head fakes. Uh, we'll get there and then boom. May, maybe the Fed meeting next week is a catalyst. Maybe they start to you know, talk more on taper. Uh, enough to get get yields uh, start to move up and then the value bid comes in and what's beautiful about this situation well I'll just read it here um, because of their cyclicals value reopening stocks relative underweight in the general indices to tech uh, we could see violent upside rallies in many stocks that have ha seen summer swoons all these stocks I'm talking about that are down 20 to 30 percent even without the general indices doing much. So we could have these stocks that are down 20, 30% rallying 20, 30, 40, even 50% into year end. And the general indices could be up another three or 4% because um, some of the heavier weights may do a lot less than what these stocks uh, have done once this dynamic changes that in this most important chart of the week and probably this most important chart of the rest of the year. Um, so mid single digit gains for the general indices through year end would be realistic, but some reopening stocks that fell 20 to 30% from June to September due to Delta and due to the change in rates, uh, shift from value to growth could be up 20, 30, 40, 50%. We've covered a number of them in our recent podcast. Okay, so we did that. Okay, Bank of America Fund Manager Survey. I love this as a read for sentiment. On Tuesday, I put out the summary 
of Bank of America's Global Fund Manager Survey, which questions 200 managers with 800 billion under management. Here were the key findings. While uh, waiting for Chinese stocks and the daily negative headlines to finally turn has felt like Chinese water torture, and according to Wikipedia, quote, Chinese water torture or dripping machine is a mentally painful process in which cold water is slowly dripped onto the scalp, forehead, or face for a prolonged period of time. That's been the summer. Uh, the process causes fear and mental deterioration in the subject. The pattern of the drops is often irregular. You know, headlines come out, you know, every few days and random. They just make stuff up what they're going to regulate next. Uh, no rhyme or reason, completely arbitrary and capricious and uh, uh, self-pain, uh, inflicting self-pain. Um, uh, the pattern of the drops is often, uh, which causes anxiety in person. Uh, okay. Uh, cold sensation is jarring which causes anxiety as the person tries to anticipate the next drip it's like oh god what's what's happening next and that's why we're so intent on when the bad news keeps coming and and the headlines couldn't have been worse this week uh and yet the stocks have largely held their uh lows from three weeks ago that's what you want to start to see and the next phase will be when do we start to see big rallies on bad news and that's when you know it's over so um over meaning it these things are going to start to take off um so despite non-stop worst case headlines coming from the communist party on a daily basis most chinese stocks have still held their bottoms for three weeks ago couple this with weak economic data and regional COVID shutdowns the chinese government will be incentivized to unleash aggressive stimulus you know, if you look at Evergrande and the real estate market and uh, people protesting outside of Evergrande because they're not getting paid, they don't want to see Tiananmen Squares. And the, the, the natives are getting restless is really what it comes down to uh, with this Evergrande thing and all this other stuff and shutting down regions for zero COVID policy. People are getting tired of it. And, uh, and they're going to have to uh, unleash aggressive stimulus, especially if they want to get reelected next year. Uh, to offset their premature tightening from six months ago and self-harming economic policies of late, which have led to a loss of confidence from foreign investors. Managers have ratcheted up their expectations of policy of this policy turn in September. China is the largest weight in the MSCI Emerging Markets Index at 35%, down from 40%. So 82% of investors now expect China to ease policy uh, in the second half of this year. Uh, that is up a uh, number of percent from last month uh and the you know give or take looks like it's up about uh you know five five or so percent and the uh percentage that expect tightening has fallen to virtually nothing you know uh, mid single digits okay the other next finding in the survey profit expectations peaked in march 21 2021 just as they did in december 2029 uh 2009 people look at this like bad news it's not uh, it also did this in February of 2002, both of which were the beginning of new cycles, not the end. So, you know, they're coming off a low base. Expectations are high. And then you say it's going to be slower. That's normal. It, we, it looks exactly like it did in February of 2002, beginning of a new cycle. In December of 2009, new beginning of a new cycle. And now uh, in 2021. Managers are expecting 1.9 trillion of stimulus to be passed by the U.S. This has come down from August. They expected more. Uh, now they expect less because of Mansion, which I think is ultimately going to be good. Also, you know, and a lot of these headlines, you know, they'll they'll say, "Oh, profit expectations have fallen." You know, we're at the end of the cycle. No, we're at the beginning of a cycle. The rate of change will slow down, but what we're going to continue to grow. When you start at zero and you go to a hundred, the rate of change is big. Uh, when you shut down the world economy and you, then you turn it on, the rate of change is big. Then when you grow normally off your pre-pandemic levels, uh, the rate of change slows down, but the economy continues to grow um okay the other thing that people view as bad oh investors are less hedged uh therefore they're not prepared for a big crash it's coming well this is also common at the beginning of new business cycles uh like you saw in february of 2013 uh sorry january 13 february 11 all the way 2009 after the crisis they uh and so on so we're we're managers are more positioned like they are at the beginning of a business cycle versus at the end uh, and long tech is the most crowded trade. So we think that could just perform less well as this value to growth changes as rates move back up. So, um, 
so that's that also short china stocks is crowded so we could have a massive short squeeze that's the most crowded short uh which will also be good and then the other thing people say is oh managers are building cash they're negative well they also built cash at the beginning of the 2013 to 14 rally into taper they were nervous about taper nervous about taper and the market continued to perform even though it had rallied hugely off the 2011 euro crisis lows uh okay finally we got a useful read from the aaii sentiment survey this week uh it flushed out the retail investors they went from 38 percent bullish to 22 percent bullish that's an extreme low uh and they went from 27 percent bearish to 39 percent bearish so they just plummeted in terms of their confidence that's good retail sentiment is now scared um fear and greed got down to 38 uh, down from 49 that shows fear is in the market and the national system of active investment managers i think is at 87 percent so you know they are if the market rips higher they're underweight if it um this is kind of a neutral read so there's nothing nothing to really say about that and then here's what everyone's been circulating and this is why everyone is expecting a, uh, a 10 to 20 percent crash six banks were out we covered it last week because seasonally the end of the month september is the weakest part of the year but everyone is looking at this this year which you know when everyone is looking for the same thing is usually when it doesn't happen and the market's designed to fool most of the people most of the time so uh i you know i would say the type of stocks that we're talking about have already had huge crashes so if you're going to see a crash um maybe it would be catalyzed in the heavier weight stocks uh like you know the apples and and uh some of those stocks that have had huge runs on low rates over the summer maybe those get hammered and, and it hurts the general indices but these start to get bid that had a much lower weight and you don't see it in the industry. So the, so you could see a situation like that. I don't think you're going to see anything devastating like everyone's looking for at all. Um, but, you know, anything is absolutely possible. But we're just focused on under the surface where we can make money. We're less concerned with this stuff. You know, will the market go up? Will the market go down? What's going to go up? Why is it going up? What's the catalyst for change and how quickly can it happen? That's all we're interested in is making money. So, um, all right, as we said in previous notes, while everyone debates whether we're going to have a September swoon or not, take a step back and look for stocks and sectors that have already had a summer swoon and buy the quality stocks that are on sale. There are more high quality companies on sale than you can imagine. And we promise to cover a bunch of them in this podcast, which we have moving right along. Uh, picked up some interesting unusual activity this week uh there was a monster order for uh viacom someone bought sixty-one thousand contracts of january 13 dollar calls in viacom that is a huge amount of stock uh deep in the money so someone thinks they know something with viacom boeing someone came in with 6600 contracts for december 220 calls we love that trade uh and then baba someone came in with 2800 contracts for march 150 calls so uh and then las vegas sands today 12,000 contracts of the 40 dollar march calls i think that's a that's a clever trade uh and that's that so um economic data for this week uh mostly mostly good uh core cpi uh, this came in less hot than anticipated, so that was good. Inflation was lower than anticipated, which gives the Fed <coughs> room to punt to November and then maybe punt uh, implementation till next year. We'll see. Big draw in oil, so that story continues to stay intact. Um, 6 million barrels, 6.4 million barrels, much bigger than expectations of 3.5 million barrels. Retail sales were better than expected, plus 7.7% uh, versus negative 0.8%. People overestimated the impact of Delta. Uh, American consumer, consumers still went to the store and made things happen. So that was good to see. And that, those are the highlights of the economic data this week. So I hope you found this helpful. Uh, I know many of you have been on the journey for many weeks. Uh, we're going to keep it going. I've really enjoyed doing it. I uh, love the people I've been able to, to meet and some of the investment partners that I've been able to attract and work with that have the same type of mindsets, uh, buying quality when it's on sale and, uh, and then uh, uh, selling it when, it when it's fully valued. And we'll continue to do that over and over and over. So with that said, 
Uh, have a great week. We'll be back uh, next week, same time, same place. In the meantime, make it a great one.